Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Victober once again. This is a month-long celebration of Victorian literature. It's a staple BookTube event, uh, and there's a tag <laughs> that's going around. Uh, it's an adaptation of the Shakespeare Journey tag that was done for Shaketember. It's the Victorian Literature Journey tag, and I saw it on Roz's channel, Scally Dandling About the Books, with wonderful, wonderful uh, chatty answers. Her channel is just so wonderful. Uh, and she got to the end of her tag and tagged everybody she could think of. Oh, just as many people as would come to mind, including uh, three people who don't make booktube videos anymore, whose channels have been inactive for a year, two years, and four years, respectively. Uh, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the cartoon character Mickey Mouse. But just wasn't enough room for me. That just it just uh, you only have so much room on the internet. So I wasn't tagged, but I want to do the tag anyway, uh, because it's it's all about you getting to know Victorian literature, which is you know kind of at the heart of Victober. So question number one is what was your first experience reading Victorian literature, and how was it? Uh, and uh, my first experience was a wonderful experience. It's going to come up again on this tag. It was Rudyard Kipling. Uh, I've made no secret on this channel that I love Rudyard Kipling. I probably have not emphasized how much I love Rudyard Kipling and how much I know his work. Uh, but it was Rudyard Kipling <laughs> that was my first experience, and it was wonderful. He is an absolutely terrific writer. Uh, question number two. Has the reading of a Victorian book ever brought you to tears? If so, tell us more. No, the reading of a Victorian book has never brought me to tears. The reading of any book has never brought me to tears. I, I, I'm, I'm not a weeper when it comes to books. I don't cry out of joy. I don't LOL. I don't RFLOL. I don't cry. I don't cry out of sadness. I, I don't read with my lymph nodes. <laughs> I, I read with my brain. So I, it's just a book. <laughs> it's just a book. That's all. So I, no book has ever done that, including no Victorian book. Uh, question number three, are there any people who played a significant role in your Victorian literature journey? Yes, there are two. Uh, a writer and an academic, Bo from both of whom I learned a good deal about Victorian literature, about books that were out there, authors that I might like, long conversations. It was wonderful. It helped a lot to demystify the whole, the whole era. Uh, and I strongly urge you to take advantage of that aspect of Victober. If you're coming to Victorian literature for the first time, Victober is the perfect thing to do that same thing. It will put you into contact with people who, A, know a lot about the subject, and B, will demystify it for you. Uh, it's one of the many the many untouted little side benefits of great booktube events like Victober is that they do that. They form great introductions. Uh, question number four, do you have a favorite film or TV adaptation of a Victorian book? I'm going to strain not to go over long on this answer. Uh, as I tend to do when we're talking about TV or movie adaptations of books, I tend to go on and I look you know, I look up and 40 minutes have passed. I'm going to try not to do that. Uh, what about one you'd like to see made? I do have a favorite. Yes, it's the cartoon maestro Chuck Jones, decades ago, did a short 20-minute cartoon of Rudyard Kipling's story, Ricky Ticky Tabby. Uh, it's narrated by Orson Welles. It's got wonderful, wonderful stuff in it. I just loved it. Abs I fell completely in love with it the minute I saw it. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I just absolutely love it. So I, that is probably my favorite. I know there are all sorts of others. Like, for instance, uh, uh, the Sean Connery, Michael Caine movie adaptation of Roger Kipling's uh, The Man Who Would Be King is terrific. It really holds up to re-watching. It really does. Uh, but as far as uh, one that I would like to see made, uh, this this could be fodder for a rant. I'm going to try not to do that. I would like to see any... I would like to see something that I'm not going to see. I'm not going to live long enough to see it. I'm not going to live long enough for the pendulum to swing back. But I would still, nevertheless, like to see an adaptation of a major or minor Victorian work that did not race or sex squap any characters. I would like to see that. That does not make me a racist. That does not make me a sexist. I would just like to see it where that wasn't done, where that kind of pandering isn't done. Uh, and I'm never going to see that. That's never going to happen. We, we will, we're only a couple of years away uh, from a black, lesbian, neurodivergent, differently-abled David Copperfield. 
and you will not be able to even squeak an objection to that without being branded on social media and to your employer as a violent racist, a, a cross-burning, sheet-wearing racist. It will ruin your life if you object to that in any way. And unfortunately, I'm, again, I'm going to try to forestall the rant. Unfortunately, the only thing that will stop that from happening is even worse than that, which is the Iron Heel of Fascism. The Iron Heel of Fascism always destroys the Weimar Republic, but it doesn't replace it with anything you want to live in. So, so you know, the, neither option is palatable. And here, I want to mention um, uh, Armando Iannacci's David Copperfield. Armando Iannacci did a recent movie adaptation of David Copperfield, and it, it starred uh, the great Dev Patel. Dev Patel is an amazingly talented young actor, and he starred as David Copperfield. It also had, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Hugh Loring? Hugh, Hugh Laurie was in it, and also did a really good job. I actually stole a couple of scenes. But Dev Patel is wonderful in that movie. I am not saying that that cannot happen. Obviously, right? Uh, great actors and actresses come in all shapes and sizes, all skin colors, all cultural backgrounds. I'm obviously not saying that that can't happen. I'm saying don't do it, uh, at least not all the time. I, it shouldn't be that you can't get a, a normal casting of a, chick, of a Dickens novel past production, that you can't get it into production. That shouldn't be true. Uh, but it is true, and it's not going to be any different. <laughs> so, so anything would be nice, even though I liked that Dev Patel, David Copperfield. I liked it very much. Uh, I'm not going to see that, though, so <laughs> we're, gonna, we're just going to pass on to the next question rather than me go on. Uh, I would I, Here I am so tempted to just talk about a hundred adaptations of Victorian classics of one kind or another, American or British, anything from the late 19th century adapted to, to film or to TV. I could go on and on and on. Oh my God. Just about Dickens alone. I could go on and on, but let's say nothing of anything else. Where are the Robert Louis Stevenson adaptations? For instance, where are they? In the last 30 years, where are they? Anything. <laughs> where are they? And keep in mind, when I when I talk about stunt casting, which is which is what DEI casting is, the, the studios don't care about social issues at all. They don't care about so about writing historical wrongs or social justice or anything like that. For them, it's just a stunt. Uh, it's just to get them a rating, to get them the right kind of rating in the industry. That's all. It's not that they believe it. Uh, but when I'm talking about stunt casting, I I could also be talking about stunt performances. It's a terrible shame, in my opinion, that the last big-budget Sherlock Holmes adaptation on the screen was whatever that Robert Downey Jr. thing is. I have no idea. I have no idea what those movies are. Uh, they're well done, I suppose. They're well done. Uh, what's the name of the actor they got to play uh, Moriarty? He was, uh, he was the, the scientist in Chernobyl. Uh, I forget his name, but... I'm not saying that those movies aren't well done, but they aren't Holmes. They aren't. They aren't Arthur Conan Doyle. And, and where are those? Where is there any? Where is the Victorian era in the movie theaters lately? Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, I won't go on. <laughs> so let's let's see. Uh, question number five: Which character in Victorian literature most resembles you, or you identify with the most? Which resembles me? I'm going to leave for other people to say. I cackled out loud when I was watching Mark at Book Time with Elvis. He did his version of this tag and I was watching his his answer to this question and at one point he said oh I don't I don't really know uh, perhaps I have a tiny bit of Lady Bracknell and I just burst out laughing because he's he's 100% Lady Bracknell he could if we were to do a, a booktube casting where where it's a, a mosaic so it's a booktube anthology of stage performances so it's not any one stage work. Instead, it's each booktuber going on stage in character as some character from literature. <laughs> Mark could walk on stage as Lady Bracknell and everybody would know who he was. Every, every booktuber has a character like that. I have no idea who mine is. Not at all. Not, like Mark says in his video, I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> but in terms of identifying most, we're back to Rudyard Kipling, and that would be Mowgli. The little boy who is raised by wolves. He's raised by the Sioni Wolfpack. Naturally. Uh, I identify with him. 
Uh, question number six. Do you have a favorite moment, scene, or line from Victorian literature? Tell us about it or read it to us. Uh, I have two. One is the, uh, there's a speech that in Anthony Trollope, Plantagenet Palliser is one of Anthony Trollope's weirdest, uh, most elusive male main characters. And we follow him from book after book after book. I don't believe we ever come to know him, even close. And I think in his case, as pat as this sounds, it's because he doesn't know who he is. But at one point, he is driven by exasperation with his oldest son into a kind of extempore speech about what he believes about manhood and public life and politics. It's too long to read, uh, but boy, oh boy, is it good. I, I, boy, oh boy, is it good. But I do have a scene to read you here on the, uh, on the Kindle. I have a scene to read you that is shorter. There's a part of it. And again, we come back to Roger Kipling. Uh, Kipling wrote uh, the Jungle Books, and then it, it did well, so he wrote a second Jungle Books. And one of the stories in the Jungle Books I've, I've talked about on this channel many, many times before is called Ka's Hunting. In this story, the little boy Mowgli is living happily with the Sioni wolf pack. He has friends in the jungle. Baloo the bear is teaching him the law of the jungle. And Bajira, the black panther, is one of his closest friends, actually bought his ransom into the Sioni wolf pack. Um, of course, Mowgli has a dedicated enemy, Shere Khan the tiger, for some of these stories. But in the in the story Ka's Hunting, Mowgli is abducted by the Bandar Log, the monkey people. These hordes of chattering little monkeys that live in the jungle and think they're the greatest and act in unison. They are very stupid. And they abduct Mowgli. They think it, that he looks kind of little like them and that this might be neat. So they, they pull him by his arms up into the trees and swing along with him along the treetops. They are headed towards the cold lairs. An abandoned old city with big ornate stone statuary and uh, deep water wells and underground chambers and whatnot that has been abandoned long since. It's overgrown. The jungle tends to stay away from it, but the Bandar Log love it. They know it well. They bring Mowgli there. Now, of course, Baloo the bear and Bagheera the black panther are alarmed about this. They're worried about their friend. They give chase, uh, but they might need an ally. There are a lot of Bandar Log. They might need an ally. And they get an ally in the 30-foot rock python named Ka, who is one of Kipling's greatest creations. He is deeply alien. You would think that a bear and a black panther will be alien if our main character is a little human boy. But Ka is far more alien than... They are basically English gentlemen. Ka is an actual alien being. Uh, and he agrees to help. And they race towards the cold lair. Baloo can't keep up with them. He can only do little spurts of speed. But uh, Bahir, the Black Panther, and Ka, the, the rock python, race towards the cold lairs. Uh, and there are a lot of Bandar Log there. And Mowgli is. They have put him in a sunken little chamber that is inhabited by cobras <laughs> in the dark. They lay their eggs down in the dark. Mowgli is safe from them because Baloo has taught him the, the, the common words of courtesy in the jungle. He's taught them, he's taught Mowgli how to speak to other animals and how to be courteous to them so they don't do you any egregious harm. We be of one blood, thou and I. Uh, so the cobra people are accepting of Mowgli, but they can't help him out. He's still the Mandar Log's prisoner. Bagheera waits until the moon is dark and then attacks. And by this time, Baloo the bear has joined them as well, and he attacks as well. They are almost immediately overwhelmed. Baloo is a mighty, strong animal, and Bagheera, of course, is deadly. It's, it's entirely an open question in the Jungle Books whether or not he is Shere Khan's equal. But against all of these monkeys, all pounding and jumping and biting, it, it's quickly going against them. And Bagheera has to resort to diving into one of the pools of water. The monkeys won't go in it. So he's temporarily safe from them, but they're all around the pool. So the minute he tries to get out, they're going to mob him again. And Baloo is being mobbed. Uh... So Bagheera calls out. He's not sure that Ka has not abandoned them. There's no sign of Ka. So he calls out for help. We be of one blood, thou and I. And Ka arrives. He breaks down a section of the wall and arrives in front of all the Bandalog, who are immediately terrified. <laughs> they are immediately terrified because he is something completely different from Baloo and Bagheera. He is their ultimate enemy. I wonder if I can find... Uh, I wonder if I can find the section. Uh, 
because Kipling does it wonderfully here. I will. I promise I won't read the whole story to you. I really wish. Uh, I really wish I could. Let's see if I can find uh, the description. Yes, there we go. Uh, generations of monkeys have been scared into good behavior by the stories their elders told them of Ka, the night thief who could slip along the branches as quietly as moss grows and steal away the strongest monkey that ever lived of old Ka, who could make himself look so like a dead branch or a rotten stump that the wisest were deceived till the branch caught them. Ka was everything that the monkeys feared in the jungle, and none of them knew the limits of his power. None of them can look him in the face. None had ever come alive out of his hug. Uh, when Ka shows up, everything changes. The monkeys might chatter, but they don't come any closer, and which allows Ka to rescue Mowgli, he batters down part of the wall. The, the, the cobra people, uh, the cobra people say, uh, "Take him away. He dances like more the peacock. He will crush our young." And and Ka notices and says, uh, "The the he has made friends everywhere. This manling, the cobras haven't killed him. They just want Ka to get rid of him. That's all. Before he crushes all their eggs, Ka batter, batters down the wall. This is when Ka and Mowgli meet. They become friends. Ka appears in other stories. This is when they meet." And uh, Ka is very grateful, but Bagheera is a little cautious and says, we should go before they attack again. Uh, and Ka has a, a uh, he has a quote. Uh, uh, yes, Bagheera says, of that we will judge later. Uh, but here is Ka to whom we owe a battle and thou owest thy life. Thank him according to our customs, Mowgli. Uh, and he does. We be of one blood, thou and I. Uh, and then... Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Bagheera cautions that uh, the Bandar Log could attack at any moment. Uh, let's see. Can I find it here? Uh, yes, they may attack again. Ka says, they will not move till I order them. Stay, you so, Ka hissed, and the city was silent once more. I could not come before, brother, he says to Bagheera, but I think I heard thee call. <laughs> he wants to sort of rub Bagheera's face in the fact that he did have to call for help. Uh, but uh, the monkeys aren't advancing. They aren't coming any closer. Uh, so we get this scene uh, at the end here. Uh, let me see. I want to get to the exact right spot here. Uh the python dropped his head lightly for a minute on Mowgli's shoulder. Imagine that. Big, huge head on his shoulder. A brave heart and courteous tongue, said he. They shall carry thee far through the jungle, manly. But now go hence quickly with thy friends. Go and sleep, for the moon sets, and what follows, it is not well that thou shouldst see. The moon was sinking behind the hills, and the lines of trembling monkeys huddled together on the walls and battlements, looking like little ragged, shaky fringes of things. Baloo went down to the tank for a drink, and Bagheera began to put his fur in order, as Ka glided out into the center of the terrace and brought his jaws together with a ringing snap that drew all the monkey's eyes upon him. The moon sets, he said. Is there yet light enough to see? From the walls came a moan like the wind in the treetops. We see, O Ka. Good. Begins now the dance, the dance of the hunger of Ka. Sit still and watch. He turned twice or thrice in a big circle, leaving his head, weaving his head from right to left. Then he began making loops and figures of eight with his body, and soft, oozy triangles that melted into squares and five-sided figures and coiled mounds, never resting, never hurrying, and never stopping his low, humming song. It grew darker and darker till at last the dragging, shifting coils disappeared, but they could hear the rustle of the scales. Baloo and Bagheera stood still as stone, growling in their throats, their neck hair bristling, and Mowgli watched and wondered. Bandar Log, said the voice of Ka at last, can ye stir foot or hand without my order? Speak. Without thy order we cannot stir foot or hand, O Ka. Good. Come all one pace nearer to me. The lines of monkeys swayed forward helplessly, and Baloo and Bagheera took one stiff step forward with them. Nearer, hissed Ka, and they all moved again. 
Mowgli laid his hands on Baloo and Bagheera to get them away, and the two great beasts started as though they had been waked from a dream. Keep thy hand on my shoulder, brother, said Bagheera, whispered. Keep it there, or I must go back, must go back to Ka. It is only old Ka making circles in the dust, said Mowgli. Let us go. And the three slipped off through a gap in the walls to the jungle. Oof, said Baloo, when he stood under the still trees again. Nevermore will I make an ally of Ka. And he shook himself all over. He knows more than we, said Bagheera, trembling. In a little time, had I stayed, I should have walked down his throat. Many will walk by that road before the moon rises again, said Baloo. He will have good hunting, after his own fashion. But what is the meaning of it all, said Mowgli, who did not know anything of the python's power of fascination. I saw no nothing more than a big snake making foolish circles till the dark came, and his nose was all sore. <laughs> Mowgli, said Bagheera angrily, his nose was sore on thy account as my ears and sides and paws, as Baloo's neck and shoulders are bitten on thy account. Neither Baloo nor Bagheera will be able to hunt with pleasure for many days. It is nothing, said Baloo. We have the man-cub again. True, but he has cost us heavily in time which might have been spent in good hunting, in wounds, in hair. I am half-plucked along my back, and last of all in honor, for I remember, Mowgli, that I, who am the Black Panther, was forced to call upon Ka for protection and Baloo and I were both made stupid as little birds by the hunger dance. All this, man-cub, came of thy playing with the Bandar Log. True, it is true, said Mowgli sorrowfully. I am evil, I am an evil man-cub, and st my stomach is sad in me. Oof. What says the law of the jungle, Baloo? Baloo did not wish to bring Mowgli into any more trouble, but he could not tamper with the law. So he mumbled, sorrow never stays punishment. But remember, Bagheer, he is very little. <laughs> I will remember. But now he, he has done mischief, and blows must be dealt. Mowgli, hast thou anything to say? Nothing. I did wrong. Baloo and thou are wounded. It is just. Bagheer gave him a do half a dozen love taps from a panther's point of view. They would hardly have waked one of his own cubs. But for a seven-year-old boy, they amounted to as severe a beating as you could ever wish to avoid. When it was all over, Mowgli sneezed and picked himself up without a word. Now said Bagheera. Jump on my back, little brother, and we will go home. One of the beauties of jungle law is that punishment settles all scores. There is no nagging afterwards. Mowgli laid his head down on Bagheera's back and slept so deeply that he never waked till he was put down in the home cave. That's how Ka's hunting ends. And uh, that is one of my favorite moments in Victorian literature because what is going on there? I believe that that is as effective a piece of fantasy of dark fantasy writing, as anything that you would find half a generation later in Clark Ashton Smith or H.P. Lovecraft. That is horrifying. When you think, I know it's a story that's half made for kids, but when you think about it, it's horrifying. <laughs> so, so I always, I never miss an opportunity to read from Cos Hunting or from any of the Jungle Books. There's only one part of the Jungle Books that I really can't reliably read to you because it always, it always really gets me. I always want to read it just in private. Uh, but that isn't one of them. Cos Hunting is a great story. Uh, where does that leave us, though? Oh, right. Uh, number seven. Does any Victorian literature intimidate you? And if so, why? <laughs> intimidate me? No. <laughs> no. What, don't tell me. Let me guess. If it really intimidates me, it might make me cry? <laughs> no. These are books written by drunken syphilitic authors. <laughs> no. They don't intimidate me. Maybe George Eliot translating Spinoza? Maybe, <laughs> because that's one gigawatt brain translating another gigawatt brain, and I don't have a gigawatt brain, so maybe. But it's still a book, okay? It's, they're all still books, and books are tiny trembling little gazelles on the African savannah. <laughs> and I am not, <laughs> so that's, I am preying on the gazelles. No, no Victorian book intimidates me. Uh, let's see here. Question number eight. What tips would you give to someone early on in their Victorian literature journey? And here, Lady Bracknell, I mean, <laughs> Mar, <laughs> suggests uh, short stories. That's an excellent suggestion. A good anthology of Victorian short stories will really give you a sense, almost certainly, of who you're going to like and who you're, gonna, you're, you're not jiving with right away. Uh, another example, another uh, tip that I would give is uh, to start simple and work your way up. The, the Victorian literature happens on the same spectrum as all other eras of literature, so you could start 
fairly simple. Short stories are a good way to do that, although there are quite a bit of Victorian short stories that are anything but simple. But you could start with, well, the Jungle Books or Sherlock Holmes. Things like that. Things that were written intentionally for popular entertainment and work your way up from there. Another uh, piece of advice that I would give when you're starting is to remember that uh, the popular entertainment was written to grab you by the lapels tell you a story right away, get you involved right away, constantly up the ante. These were written, these were serialized in periodicals. They tended, every chapter or bit tended to end with a thump to make sure you came back. Uh, that's one end of the spectrum. The other th piece of advice I would give you is to remember that the other end of the spectrum was written for a different kind of entertainment span than we give today. The Victorians had no doom scrolling, they had no cat videos, they had no TV, they had no radio. So, if you're going to read a bigger, longer work, I would say especially vulnerable here would be George Eliot. Uh, you have to keep that in mind. That the, the bigger, longer, more serious works are, they're going to unfold at a different walking pace than most of the stuff you would read in, for instance, all the stuff in the 21st century, but most of the stuff in the 20th century as well. You just have to keep that in mind. The Victorian literature was not competing with theater, with the movies. It wasn't competing with movies or TV. It was pretty much the last long era of literature that wasn't. So you just have to get that, you have to get used to that sort of ambit. Once you do, you'll be fine because they can tell a story. Boy, oh boy, can they. Um, and then question number nine is, what is your top recommended read for other readers of Victorian literature? And here, I just because they're familiar with Victorian literature doesn't mean I'm gonna have a, recommend, a recommendation for them, no. No, no, no. For a beginner, that's one thing. If you're totally new to Victorian literature, I have a whole bunch of suggestions that I can make things not to do and things to do. But if you're already familiar with Victorian literature, then you go right back to what I do for all recommendations, which is ask you a million questions. I don't have any blanket recommendations at all. I, the closest that I come would be uh, something like uh, the aforementioned Anthony Trollope novel, The Duke's Children, where forever and ever you could read it in an, in an abridged format when it, it came out periodically. But then when Trollope's publisher wanted him to put it into a book, they asked him to take a lot of stuff out. A lot, I forget the exact number of pages, but it was a lot of pages. He took them all out. And publisher a publisher recently brought combed through the original publication and constructed what du The Duke's Children was like when it was not edited by its author and brought it out in a volume. I might suggest that maybe if you're fascinated by a Victorian work, you read all the different editorial jump cuts, so to speak. These, these things were published serially. Then the author made that into a book. Often then, if the author lived long enough, they made it into a, a new edition of that book and sometimes made cuts or editions. So maybe look around there, but as to an individual book, I would need to know all my usual 100 questions. I would need to, to conduct a physical exam and find out what you're in the mood for next. I take book recommending very seriously, so I wouldn't I wouldn't just toss off a recommendation. Uh, and then there's tagging people, but there's literally no one other than me that Roz didn't tag, including a Canadian prime minister, a uh, popular children's cartoon character. <laughs> so so uh, 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 everyone else was tagged, so everyone has been tagged in this tag. If you haven't been for some reason or other and you want to do it, by all means, do it. It's a wonderful tag. I'd love to hear your answers. Uh, but anyway, that is my my Victorian literature journey tag. Here's hoping that we have a journey tag adapted to every booktube event. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, I, I will. If it doesn't happen organically, I will do it myself. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that's a second tag for Tag Tuesday. I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, booktube.